Favorite airplane. Why did you like that one the best? It was, uh, no, you knew you had the power when you wanted it. You also knew that the mission that you knew, which was a 24-7 mission, um, I have sat in the Rukirva Road. When the 67th went north to Karat, I would go with the 67th. When the 67th had the nuclear pad, I, would, I wouldn't do it 24 hours because I had other chores to do. Sure, right. Ring. You had a little radio to carry around, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> carry the brick. Uh, yeah. Um, horrible responsibility, too. Um, but uh, I liked the speed. I liked the feel. Um, never wanted to tangle with a MIG, you know, right. get into any kind of a... Uh, Aerobatic match with them wouldn't be. But you could do 1.2 on the deck, and they couldn't do that. That's right. Did you ever get into that situation? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, well, how many combat missions did you have in, in, Viet in Vietnam? Well, they didn't call them combat missions. They called them the the bosses uh, mission. But uh, we did not deliver nuclear weapons. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I flew two uh, that you could call combat missions. One particular mission, the, the guy, have you ever heard of his word, Robbie Reisner? Yeah, right. Robbie? Yeah. Robbie was considered one of the top 105 guys. Um, Remember I mentioned Robbie Reisner? Yeah. Here's no, 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 let me, what, no, he was a, he was a long-time prisoner, wasn't that it? Well, here's Singapore down here. I was down there with uh, five F-105s, uh, uh, fooling around with the uh, British uh, fighters, Singapore. And I got the word that up here at Karat, Thailand, Robbie Reisner had gotten shot down. And he was head of the 67th Squadron, which I normally flew with. But I, I heard he got shot down. I hopped into a 105, and, and I was, as I was leaving the operations, I, I told the operations officer, get me a tanker, I'm going to go replace Robbie. So I flew directly. A tanker did meet me right about there and went in to find out what happened to Robbie and uh, they, they were devastated. Uh, he was one of these guys that you're never, never going to lose him, you know. And then he wound up prisoner of war. When I arrived on Okinawa to take command, what happened, General Holloway um, called me one time and he said, uh, Bob, you've just done a terrific job. Um, you should be rewarded. What, what would you like? I said, I would like to command a fighter wing, sir. He said, have you heard of the 18th? I said, yes, sir. They've never been assigned in the States. They're always up somewhere at the front line. He said, I commanded it at one time. Um, I'm going to get you command of the 18th. So I arrived at Okinawa. And of course, I had a bunch of the 105 jocks meeting me. And Robbie Reisner stepped up to the ship guy and says, Glad to meet you. Uh, you, uh, you know General Holloway real well. He's revered out here. And I said, Oh, yeah. Later, 
he got me aside and he said, please don't take this wrong, but um, we've looked you up in fighter aces. You're, you're not in fighter aces. Huh. No one, one pilot remembered you did command the 51st down at Naha, so you have been in fighters. Um, but uh, they're a tough bunch. I have a suggestion. Again, don't take it wrong. As commander of the wing, you can order a command shootout, wing shootout, you and me. Uh, and um, we've got three things. We got the over shoulder maneuver, one. We got the air to ground, air to air, three missiles. And so we'll set up combat, you and me, three missions. Well, I actually, uh, I actually beat him on the air to ground. He beat me on the over the shoulder and over and the uh, air to air. Um, so when we landed from that little shootout, he got up on the bar at the officer's club, sweaty clothes, and he said, hey, listen to me, jocks, you got yourself a commander. I didn't win it over out, but he almost did. So that was my... <laughs> Baptism in the F-105 wing, oh, wow. Robbie Reyes. And I have a picture here. Well, I can't, I can't imagine, you know, on the, on the over the shoulder, I mean, that'd be so much a matter of luck about where that thing lands. Was it a parachute type uh, bomb, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, if the wind changes two knots, it's going to change it 50 uh, feet, you know. It changed it in my direction. Yeah. <laughs> and the air to ground, what did you do? Drop bombs and gunnery as well? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, well, well, you'd flown F-86s before, so it wasn't like... No. And at that point, there weren't many aces left in the Air Force. <laughs> All the aces were... Well, maybe not. I mean, Bud Anderson. You probably you know Bud Anderson. Oh, yeah. Bud was a, a, also in the 105. Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah. I, I interviewed him three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. He was a nice guy. Really nice guy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, uh, Boris Baird, Boris, B-O-R-I-S, yeah. Baird, B-A-R-D, kind of became my uh, C&I um, whenever I went up the Karat, he took care of it. So they'd send you on a little safer mission, yeah. not, to, not into Hanoi and all yeah. that. Well, the... the this was the wrong bird for that mission. I mean, you know, take out SA, uh, SA SAM sites. Uh, the A-10 would have probably been better. But... Uh, well, the A-10 didn't have until 1971 or two, something like that. Uh, and, it's, but they, and they came in the same way every day. They, yeah. You know, it's... The guys would look at their watch and say, oh, it's about time. <laughs> Smoke a cigarette and get ready for them to come in. Not only that, the State Department, I mean, the Air Force, the Air Force would send out to me, you know, out there, the orders of the day, uh, target, target access. Right. The State Department would send that same thing Oh. through state ch channels. The way I figured out that somebody was because the targets that we would hit once that wasn't offended, the next time I figured maybe they learned, but somebody knew we were coming. Uh, and there were plenty of targets. But uh, I later I checked with a guy in the headquarters and they said, well, I can't state it with a certainty, but I think 
the State Department was sending out the target list to prevent civilian casualties. Oh. Excessive civilian casualties. Um, if I could prove it, I would, but I can't. There was something I was reading later on in the about you. You were involved in later in your career in target selection. Oh, but yeah. that was nuclear stuff, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I was, how much target selection could there be? I mean, <laughs> did uh, it change daily or something like that? Or I was in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, General LeMay was there, and I had the uh, I had to develop the NSTL. National Strategic Target List. It didn't matter who the delivery was, but I had to develop. In response to the, um, I had to develop a list of targets that we would hit. Nuclear or otherwise, but mainly nuclear. They called it, the na they didn't call it nuclear, they called it National Strategic Target List, NSDL. It's a document. Um, emphasis on a retaliate, re retaliate, retaliating a, a nuclear strike on us. In other words, what targets would we hit if we had been attacked with a nuclear response? So that's why nuclear comes in. But in other words, I had the okay, assuming a nuclear attack had been placed on us based on where, how bad, and so forth, where, where would we go after the certain targets? in response to that. So it was re retaliatory national strategic list. Well, when, you know, this, this reminds me, when, <clears throat> in Germany, 66 through 68, you know, we set a lot of alert. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> just because there's just nothing to do, you know. And then we'd fly. Yeah, it was probably a list on where you were was a recipient of elements of the national strategy. Sure. Well, what happened though is our, our nuclear alert lines, we call them lines for some reason, we always had, you know, fixed targets and and they were usually airfields and sometimes a road intersection which seemed to be important for some reason. But then during one ORI we had, um, we had, you know, alternative targets that we were supposed to, and, and they, we had a big map which showed all the, where all the other explosions were going to go off. So we had to plan our way through so you didn't get nuked yourself. And I recall we had our helmets and we had an eye patch. We'd have to put this eye patch on, maybe remember this. So you're supposed to fly with one eye, so if you got blinded in that eye, then you can take the patch off and use your eye. But, but looking at that map, you know, I was looking and it looked like trying to figure out all these numbers and codes that we would be like maybe the fourth or fifth or third airplane to hit the same target. There was that much overkill, it seemed like, for all these targets. And we were trying to figure out what the hell was hitting them first. What, Polaris missiles or something or other? I mean, but it was incredible. I mean, I mean, my God, there wouldn't have been anything left. I remember that room there in um, Omaha um, where I had the brief. Secretary of Defense, General May, civilian, forgot what he was, um, on the NSTL, and why we had selected that target or that target or that target. I can tell you that basically, as far as the NSTL was concerned, Part of the targets were knocking out their nuclear capability. 
not just ballistic missiles, but other, where we had intelligence information. But also uh, strategic points of um, transportation, manufacture, etc. Um, and time-wise, that's why each had a little code. Uh, daytime, nighttime, what time, or what vehicle to deliver it. Yeah, right. Um, I think we carried, uh, what was it, B-28s and B-43s and sometimes a, was it a 57, B-57 or something like that, a little small. Mm -hmm. It was a horrible thing to think about when you think about it. But, you know, I, I, to... You just hit the one part of the Bible that I had to go by. I called it the What If Bible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that was to try to have a listing of targets that would be implemented if one of these What Ifs happened. And the What If Bible had a lot of listings including uh, revol rebellion, revolt within a particular country, etc. Um, it was a mammoth listing, computerized, highly computerized. And that was 30 years, 40 years ago. Must really be computerized now. Oh, yeah. Well, I wonder what's going to happen with... Uh, I don't think the Iranians are going to do anything. I think they want to get their economy going again. Who? The Iranians. I mean, the, oh. they have, you know, they're pretty religious, but they're not suicidal, you know. Yeah, um, the guy in Poyang, though, mm, yeah. They're dangerous. Um, but I don't think they have a desire to run the world. Well, and if you think about the guy in North Vietnam, if I was him, you know, I would do everything I could to keep everybody away. I'm going to start a war if you guys take a punch at me. I'm going to, you know. So it's it's probably a good resistance. And he's got himself a defensive, a defensive trying to get himself in the defensive mode. That um, if we lose our mind and go after him. He can cause great damage. Oh, yeah. Just a just a standing army. Mm -hmm. They could sweep through the first thirty miles of one of the. Well, what do you think? I think you probably got about another ten, ten or fifteen hours worth of stories <laughs> to tell. But um, when it's late at night at the bar in the old days, what's your favorite story? Oh God. came up with a thud. The thud now was a nuclear weapon. And the way you did it, yeah, over the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had an Okinawa, the wing I had in Okinawa, uh, 105s, I had 12 airplanes lined up at 45 degrees to the runway with a chain in front of each one of those airplanes and a control pod that gave the, if I gave the order, the chains would drop and they had a couple of minutes to get all airborne loaded with weapons. So we actually set nuclear alert 24-7, month after month. What year was that? 1965, uh, 66. Um, well, that's what I was doing in Europe too. In 60, 66, 67, 68, we, you know, Victor Alert, we called it. Mm -hmm. Did they call it Victor Alert in the Pacific? or <laughs> No, Thud Alert. <laughs> no, I don't know why they call it Victor Alert. But, but So I, I devised a, a merry-go-round. The airplanes more or less stayed in place, except the ones we lost. One squadron had the nuclear alert pad. The other squadron was up in Karat combat over North Vietnam. 
one squadron still here in the States training to go up there. And so when these guys finished combat, they sat on the pad. Oh. The pad moved over here, and these guys got up there. So the, every 59 days, I did it for per diem. <laughs> it could have been any time. Um, well, what, where did the F-105 carry the nuclear? It was back in the Bombay. tail. It was a Bombay? You had Bombays. Look at the one at March. It's regular Bombays. I don't um, verbalize the story very often because it's painful. You remember I, the, the daisy chain I, I had uh, sitting nuclear alert? Karat, etc. Mm -hmm. Right. There was a general in command of the Air Force over there in the South Pacific. He visited me at my headquarters there in Okinawa and uh, said, I come, came down here to congratulate you on dreaming up your daisy chain. You've been able to hold down uh, for a full nine months of something that would have taken three separate organizations to cover the same missions. Um, so I've come down here to uh, ask you to uh, be chief of staff of Fifth Air Force. That's a general's job. <laughs> And I said, well, you know, I, I thank you, sir, for the, for the offer. It's a, uh, but I fly with the 67th, and they won't miss me in the combat. <laughs> it's not that. It's just uh, it won't look good for me to be sitting in a nice plushy chair in Tokyo. Um, but... Um, if you if you are, must have me, we're gonna find. And he said, "Oh no, no." Uh, he said, "That's all right. Uh, you should be repaid." And he left. I didn't know nothing. When it came time for me to come home, I didn't have any orders. I contacted General Holloway and I said, "General, I'm ready to come back. I don't have any orders. You got me this job." Uh, he said, Bob, uh, I'm going to meet you in San Francisco. Your orders are going to be deployed with your family to San Francisco for further reassignment. He did. He met me in San Francisco. And he said, uh, you know where your pilots came from? I said, yeah, I'm a Connell Air Force Base. Uh, was a training base for 105s. Or he said, well, it's also the headquarters for the Air Division, and it includes uh, uh, SR-71s overseas. Uh, it includes quite a bit, uh, and it's a general officer's position. But besides that, I know you have a large family, and they have very fine quarters for the commander there. He said, but I'll never be able to promote you, Bob, because the general out in Southeast Asia has written into your record that this officer does not understand leadership. He should never be placed in general officer's position. I turned him down. He didn't say that, but that's what happened. So well, that, is, now that is really strange. Uh, so he said, so Bob, that's why we've had a little trouble getting you assigned. I've pulled a lot of strings. And, um, because you wanted to stay in the pilot seat and be a, a hands-on operational guy rather than sit in a nice leather chair in Japan. But he didn't even understand what the hell an operational guy goes through when he 
lives and dies with people. Yeah. I mean, so far, as I, as I, I told Holloway, uh, there's no greater bond between two human beings than those that have been in combat with other people. So the, so the bond, almost love, you have for all those people, you only find that. And that's what basically I was trying to transmit to this general. Um, but anyway, he said, so if you don't mind not making it, um, it's going to be a nice place for you. And it was, when I had McConnell, the only place out here in the West Coast that could refuel me was Miramar Navy. Right. So I used to borrow a 105 out of McConnell and right. fly out here. And that's when I saw that lake. Right, there, yeah. And I bought the land. Um, so, uh, uh, well, that's a, that's that's basically a regret you have for not. Well, but but the regret. But the regret was for making the right decision. <laughs> the way I look at it, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> not only that, I'm at McConnell. When I had arrived at McConnell, there were a couple of things that had to be taken care of. One was the governor of Kansas. Kansas is a Republican state, and the governor was a Democrat. And he needed a place to hide out. Um, so I set it up where his adjutant general would call my first lieutenant <laughs> security guy. And uh, when he wanted to hide out for a while, he would his adjutant would call my security lieutenant. The doors would fly open. He'd drive early in the morning, VIP quarters number one, and the governor was there unannounced. The head chef at the knew he'd furnish the food that he wanted. We had this all down. Uh, and one day, um, tell Holloway again, said, Bob, the President Johnson is out on the West Coast at a Navy base. And on his way home, he wants to visit an Air Force base. And he has selected McConnell because he knows something I don't know. You, you have 40 wives snatched away at an auxiliary base. I said, oh, yes, I've been meaning to tell you about that. <laughs> Those were the 40, 105 wives who had lost their husbands over there, and they all followed Gladys, Queen Gladys. They loved her as much as the guys loved me. <laughs> and what I did, I took a base that had been closed right north of uh, McConnell, and uh, I opened up the housing for these gals. And I got a picture of them, if you want to look at no, that. Right. Um, <laughs> and he said, well, it's very nice of you and all that, but right now the big problem is he wants to talk to each one of the wives <coughs> and um, call them by name and tell them about their husbands. Um, also, he doesn't, we don't want anybody shooting at him. Your security has to be beefed up. Um, and he wants 15,000 I Love Johnson fans out on the ramp. Mm. Um, In a Republican so, state. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Jesus. so you got a job right now. I'm not going to bug you. You don't even have to report in. I don't want to know. I said, okay, so I called the governor. I said, sir, on your next trip down here, I gotta talk to you. So I told him, I, so he said, don't worry about it. 
just tell your security lieutenant to tell me, give me six hours notice or more, and I'll have the National Guard ring your base, Kansas National Base. Right. Not a mouse could have crawled in there. Right. Um, the 15,000 I love Johnsons have your material people make up the signs, and again, the three o'clock or so in the morning, cars are going to start coming in, just shove a sign in there. Um, the problem of the women, I told Gladys, how are we going to do that? She said, well, they all wear nameplates, so he can look at the nameplate and call them by name. Yeah. And I have them come down once a month for brunch, so I won't be surprised. And I give them a little corsage when they come down. And I can make I do is look at the corsage, look at the nameplate, and then and that son of a bitch pulled it off. As we as we're leaving to head over towards the gals, I'm walking along. He leaned over, he was tall. He leaned over, he said, Colonel, what's that code again? <laughs> Thank you. And he went up and down that line. She kind of kind of felt bad because but on the other hand, they were so overjoyed that the president knew about their husband personally, et cetera. And it made them happy, but it was uh, not, not me, you know. That isn't something I generally like to do. But, uh, but anyway, the next day, I'm sitting in my office, holiday call. Bob, uh, he's sitting down. I said, oh, me, he's coming back to do something wrong. Oh, no, no, he was all aglow. Uh, you remember the chief of the Air Force was there when all this was happening. Who would that be? Okay. I've forgotten now. Shriver? Uh, no, not Shriver, no, no. I, I, you can see his picture. We'll, we'll, we'll pull it up in a minute, let's... Um, he said, no, no, no. Uh, uh, he told the president, I want that whippersnapper that flew down that road in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, all the things he did over uh, at 105, I want him promoted tomorrow. Oh, wow. That's the day I made general. <laughs> uh, this is Governor Docking. I don't know that name. Kansas, Governor Kansas. Well, that's the get. Yeah. Dave, what, what did you think about the war when it was going on? Did you think it was a winnable situation? or Which one? Vietnam. I don't think you ever would win in, in the sense that you've conquered. It, it just has to fit away like it did you. This is when he first came, got off the airplane. Guess who that is back there with him. Oh, he had McNamara. Wow. <laughs> uh, is that you right next to him there? Yeah, that's me. I was a colonel. Well, it, now, isn't that, when you think about it, that really is interesting that it, that managed to get you promoted to general. I wasn't planned. 